Our next author, David McCraney's book is doing so well that I don't actually have a physical copy of it because we are out of stock in our warehouse. So I'm gonna quickly share my screen here so you can all see what his book, How Minds Change, looks like. David McCraney is an author, science journalist, lecturer, and the creator of the blog, You're Not So Smart, which became an internationally best-selling book, later followed by You Are Now Less Dumb, so generous. David currently hosts the popular You Are Not So Smart podcast and speaks internationally about irrational thinking and delusion. Before finding internet fame, he graduated with a degree in journalism from the University of Southern Mississippi and cut his teeth covering Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast and in the Pine Belt region of the Deep South. He has been a beat reporter, editor, photographer, voiceover artist, television host, digital content manager, and everything in between. Most recently, he wrote, produced, and recorded a six-hour audio documentary exploring the history of the idea and the word genius. Thank you for this fantastic intro. Also, uh, this is incredible to be amongst all these amazing people. These books are so cool. They, uh, this is also something I've been obsessed with for a long time, hence the book, How Minds Change. I would like to tell you how this happened. I've um, had a podcast for uh, 10 years. I'm one of those early podcasters that's still in it. And the podcast has always been about the psychology of reasoning and decision making and judgment. And so you, you do that long enough and you build up a giant brain trust of scientists that you can lean on. And I uh, had this thing happen to me that got me onto this new obsession, which was I was giving lectures about what I, if you take everything I, I do on my beat and you shrink it down, it's mostly about motivated reasoning. And if you've never had anyone explain motivated reasoning uh, or get a definition of it, uh, my favorite way of describing it is, you know, when someone is uh, falling in love with someone and they're telling you all about them and you ask them, what do you like about them? Why do you want to be with this person? And they they'll say, well, something like well, the, the way they talk, the way they, the way they walk, the way they cook their food, uh, all the music they're introducing me to. And then when that person is breaking up with that exact same person and you ask why you're breaking up with them, what are your reasons? They'll say, oh, well, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they cut their food, the, the dumb music they make me listen to. So the essence of that is the reasons for it can become reasons against when the motivation to search for reasons to justify and rationalize your changing emotional state uh, changes. When the motivation changes, you pluck those same reasons and use them differently. And what's you know key in that is that the reasons never cha change, like they're still the same facts. And uh, this fact-based approach, I kept seeing it not working out there when people are trying to deal with polarization and conspiratorial thinking. I was giving lectures about that and I had a very pessimistic view and someone came up to me after uh, one of these lectures and she said that her father had fallen into a conspiracy theory and she asked me what to do about it. And at that time, I thought that I had good advice, which was uh, you, nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. It was one of those things that gets bandied around. You can't reason somebody out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. But I didn't like the answer. Like I didn't like the, her reaction. I didn't like the way it made me feel to be so uh, pessimistic and cynical. And I felt like I really wasn't an expert on this topic and I wanted to explore it more. And at the same time, same-sex marriage in the United States, the attitudes had changed so dramatically uh, just over a couple of years. And I looked up the research, I talked to some um, political scientists about it, and they told me it was the fastest shift in public opinion ever recorded at the time. And you had millions of people, it was more than 68% of Americans in the United States went from being opposed to same-sex marriage to being in favor of it over the course of about a decade and, and, and very quickly over the course of about three years, if you chart it on a graph. And I couldn't help but think, what if you took all of those people and put them in a time machine and sent them back a decade? Like, would they argue with themselves? Would they, would it be impossible for them to see eye to eye on that issue, the way people argue with thing on the, things on the internet all the time today? Because as astonishing as it seems, like same-sex marriage used to be this really uh, molten hot wedge issue that people talked about online and there were articles that were endlessly produced saying that you could never change somebody's mind about that issue and then it felt like all of a sudden everyone did and i wanted to know what happened between those two moments like in their brains like i want to know how does a person change their minds how do we change each other's minds and that sent me on this journey but when i first went out to to get my first uh, well, i sold the book uh, and they had this idea for this book and uh, the first person I spoke to was Jim Alcock, who's a, a belief researcher. And I used one of these uh, old journalism 
tricks for you. I said, pretend I'm five years old. Uh, what is a belief? Just, just start there. And I'll never forget, he pushed back in his chair and went, that is a tough question. Um, I really can't give you an answer. And I was terrified because I was imagining t- telling this to my editor. Uh, and I was like, well, how come you can't give me an answer on this one simple question? He's like, uh, you've been studying this for 45 years. It's your specialty. And he said, it's because I've been studying it for 45 years and that's my specialty. I cannot give you a definition of the word belief. So I went back to the drawing board and this is how the book actually unfolded. I'm very happy about this because it's not Wikipedia with jokes. It's not just a bunch of research with uh, with my twist on it. It's it's in a, it's on the ground and uh, you go with me. I went and changed the course. I embedded myself with Westboro Baptist Church and the people who had left it with a variety of conspiratorial communities and people who had left them. I uh, embedded myself with cults and pseudo cults and uh, the flat earthers, which are uh, actually a really fun group of people to hang out with. They're very uh, open minded, except for one very particular issue and uh, people who had left all those groups because I wanted to see what it takes to leave an organization like that, a community like that. And then I brought that to scientists and then asked the scientists to explain what I was seeing. And then I ventured out and met all these organizations who change people's minds professionally, uh, street epistemology and, and deep canvassing and uh, therapists who work in things like motivational interviewing and CBT. And it did all that in person as well, embedded with all those groups. And I started noticing that across these organizations that change people's minds professionally, they tended to have the exact same advice. And if they put it into a bulleted list, the list was in the same order of operations. And it really felt like I was discovering something that I'd never seen in a book before. I got very excited about this and it's been a huge obsession. I switched gears to even on the podcast. It's mostly what I talk about today because it turns out, oh, this is something we all want to know about very deeply. Um, I wanted to share one little story from the, from the book. And it's one of my favorite bits. I, when it gets to the, like neuroscience, the uh, the actual like um, like the nuts and bolts of what's going on at the atomic level, and then building up from that. I really wanted to tell you what was going on in the brain when you resist a change, when other people resist change, what it means to try to persuade someone, what is the science of it. I I wanted something on the ground, and I got this great gift of meeting the scientist who uh, discovered why people saw the dress differently. You remember the dress in 2015? Some people, it's an image that was so viral that it broke Twitter. Uh, because of all the hashtags people were sharing because they were arguing about it. And some people see it as black and blue. Some people see it as yellow and gold. And the neuroscientists that uh, cracked the case on that, they uh, actually, this is, I think, uh, I hope I have this for you. Yeah, I actually got to go and see the actual dress, which uh, as you can see in in real life, it's uh, black and blue. But the image is whatever your brain says it is. And that's because they discovered that what was happening with the dress was it was uh, the image was ambiguously overexposed and the brain wishes to disambiguate the overexposure. You can't tell just by looking at it if it's overexposed in sunlight or it's overexposed in artificial light and since sun or, or skylight, I guess you could say that's mostly blue and artificial light incandescent light is mostly uh, in the yellow side of the spectrum. And if you assume that it's overexposed by the sky, you will, as they say in neuroscience, subtract the luminant to try to get a better understanding, to see it more clearly. And we're always doing this all the time with every overexposed image, but we're unaware of that. As if you subtract the blue, then you see a yellow and, and a white and gold dress. And if you assume it's overexposed in incandescent light, you'll subtract that light from the image and you'll see a black and blue dress. And it's important in the story of how minds change because they developed a model around this called surf pad, which means, and I had to pull this up to make sure I say it correctly, Substantial uncertainty in the presence of ramified or forked priors or assumptions will lead to substantial disagreement. And the reason that's important is, as the scientist at NYU explained to me, without cognitive empathy, a person who sees the dress one way and encounters someone else who sees it another uh, could just assume that the way they see it is correct and the way the other person sees it is wrong. And if you were to get in some sort of debate with a person over an issue like that, I was trying to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong, or I'm trying to win and I want you to lose, then you will miss out on the chance of doing something very special, which I advocate for throughout the book, and something that I deeply changed my mind about. I didn't, I never intended to, to do this as some sort of marketing thing where I would tell people, I wrote a book about changing your mind that changed my own mind about how minds change, but that's what happened. And part of that's in that surf pad story and that story of the, uh, the dress. Because as they told me, it would be very easy for people to form communities around these two different ways of seeing this thing. Um, in the modern way the internet works, people could 
grow those communities to the point that it becomes a social identity. And as the sociologist Brooke Harrington told me, if there was an Eagles MC square of social science, it would be that the fear of social death is greater than the fear of physical death. And it is more likely to motivate and drive behavior than anything else. And if your identity became, I am a dress, I'm a blue black person, or I'm a white and gold person when it comes to this, and those groups became large enough to exert political uh, control, pressure and, and power, you could get something very weird. And they spoke of cognitive empathy and the fact that you could, instead of trying to change somebody's mind about that dress and trying to get them to see it the way you see it, you could say, hmm, instead of that, what if we, instead of facing off, we got shoulder to shoulder and we said, isn't it? mysterious that we do see this differently i wonder why and it's only through a conversation like that would you ever actually get to the real truth of the matter which is how brains make sense of things outside of that if you tried to win the debate well the only person who ever wins a debate is the person who doesn't change their mind and you miss out on an opportunity to do something much more grand and special which is discover the truth together through collaboration and, and some sort of uh non-judgmental listening and cognitive empathy and in the book i explain how to do that and it's been a great pleasure to put it together and present it to the world and i hope you get a chance to read it i love it i can't stop talking about it but i have to because my time is up so thanks very much